When I left, I knew that I was right, but I took no comfort in being right. right. Because what about the last two and a half decades of my life? Yeah. What exactly do I do to account to myself for all of that? What is it that kept us mm. for so long? I cannot put my finger on a single thing that was good enough for me to give two and a half decades of my life to it. Those were really actually good things that happened as a result of this. I started thinking in the right direction about a lot of things, and I started questioning a lot of the right things. When you step back from all of that crazy thinking and indoctrination, nothing about this religion makes any sense whatsoever. Take the first small step out of the confines of faith and see how much bigger the world is than that little house you've been confined to inside your brain. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And it's time to get Unbound. But there's two of you living and breathing still. The fellow you are, and he's tough to see. And another chap, if you've got the will, the man that you still have a chance to be. That's from a poem called His Other Chance by Edgar Albert Guest. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And in this episode, we'll be talking about taking your Unbound experience past the Four Sunday Challenge and looking at some of the benefits, but also the pitfalls of getting and staying Unbound. There is a price to be paid for getting out, that's for sure. But like I said last week, staying in is costlier by far when you look at it in terms of the rest of your life and how you choose to spend it. But before we get into any of that, uh, we've got the usual suspects, the usual lies. Yeah. And Ken Ham is back to steal a few more of our IQ points. Yes. That can only mean that it's time for Christians behaving badly. Shell, what have you got for us this week? Well, one of the problems with doing this segment is that the same people keep saying ridiculous and stupid things. And I really don't want to devote an entire section to the same people unless they do something especially egregious to start with. So I made some bullet points. Okay, let's have them. For a donation of $1,000, Jim Baker will send you two books, a CD, a DVD, plus a miracle blanket that, if you put your bills under it, will miraculously help you pay them off. A thousand dollars. A thousand For two books, a CD, a DVD, and a blanket. Yep. Okay. So what is this blanket made of? It looks like a regular old fleecy blanket. I mean, so seriously. It's not even like a good blanket. No, no. Because it's... a good blanket could go for $1,000. Uh, it would have to be like Shetland wool to go for that much. I well, mean. well that's, that's entirely my point. You know, yeah, what's, what's the value added with this? Or is the there? The value added is the magic. The magic that is put inside to help you pay your bills. Got it. <laughs> so, and I don't know, for for $1,000, you know, if if I was the type of person that just had $1,000 sitting around, right. I would love to pull like a John Oliver and <laughs> just buy one of these things and do the experiment at home and report on what happens. You know, if my bills get paid, yeah, right. I mean, I still feel like I'd be going to work, so right. that would kind of help get the bills paid yeah but you know i mean you can attribute anything to anything but it doesn't make it so and no. he's an excellent grifter if i have to say yeah. something positive about the guy he <laughs> is an excellent grifter he yes. has slipped out of some very 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 tight spots yes and he keeps coming back mm -hmm. i was actually thinking like not even a couple of days ago it's like when is jim baker going to show up on the show again <laughs> Well, and, just as well, it here we are. Yeah, here we are because here he is, and he's doing this, and this does not surprise anyone at this no. table, and probably no one who's listening to this show. Mm -mm. But I mean, when I look at that, it's like a thousand bucks, and that's what you get. And there are people out there that think that that's reasonable. 
And that's I just, the scary part. I just don't get it because if you have a thousand dollars, you can put it towards your bills, and you don't have to worry about any of that. Well, there's an idea. Yeah. I'll bet they never thought of that one. No. Coming up next, Cat Kara says that there are volcanoes in heaven, and you can ride the lava just for funsies. And, of course, Steve Schultz, the most gullible man in the world, believes her. Well, of course he does. I mean, all he does is sit there and bob his Nod. Head. Everything is yes. Every now and then he'll say something that's a little bit more expressive. Right. But usually it's just a lot of head bobbing. Yeah, lots of head bobbing. Ride the lava. Ride the lava. Oh, I, every single time this woman comes out with something new, I keep saying it over and over and over again. Like, nothing surprises me with this. But she manages to <laughs> surprise me with the sheer level of stupid. Yeah. In the things that she puts out there on YouTube and on the other channels that she's involved in, it absolutely blows my mind. Mm. The level of stupid <laughs> that comes from this person and the fact that she has a following yeah. is, I mean, it's a little scary. It is. To think that she has a following. It is. She's got a great imagination. It's too bad that she's sunk in this. Well, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to have a great imagination. It's another thing to have an imagination that's the product of this level of a reprobate mind. Yeah, it's pretty bad. It's beyond bad. This this is someone who is not mentally ill. This is probably someone who is mentally unsalvageable yeah. at this point, yeah, which is I, very I, scary. Yeah, I feel kind of bad for her. I do, too. I mean, it's just... I, I, I don't like her as a person, as a persona. As anything, I don't like this person, but I think that it's kind of tragic. Yeah. Her in particular. I mean, all of them. They're right. They're just, and I think that it's awful, and we're going to actually get into this a little bit more in the main segment. I right. do think that it's awful what these people succumb to yeah. after a while, what they become because of what this religion does to them. But mm. Kat Kerr is on a level of her own. Yeah, she's definitely And she's going to get scarier as she yeah. gets older. That's the crazy part. Yeah, it is Things are scary. just going to get scarier and crazier and more out there. And there will still be people who believe her. Yeah. And I that's know. the even scarier part. Yeah, I know. And final bullet point for today is Pat Robertson believes that the Lord is going to give him another 29 years. He wants to make it to 120. You know, like Moses. Good luck with that. Yeah. Good luck with that. The dude looks like he's 150 already. I know. I know. It's kind of... He's aged a lot. I yeah. mean, I remember his kind of botched presidential run. Yeah, and I And I remember what he looked like then. Uh, and... He really... He's aged beyond his years already. Yeah. I'm not sure what he's... makes him think he's going to get another three decades. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm going to get another three decades. <laughs> I, I know, mean, right? I'm going to try. <laughs> oh, I'm hoping. I'm, yeah. I'm hoping for actually quite a bit more. Yeah. With modern medicine being what it is, I don't think that it's outside the realm of reason to expect a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Pat Robertson. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a little bit ahead of us at this point. <laughs> a little bit. I think he's 91. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. that's that's what the that's what the math tells me. Yeah. Yeah, 91 years old. And he thinks he's going to live to be 120. 120. We'll see. Well, you never know. Some of these people have staying power. They do. And, you know, a lot of times the crazier they are, the longer they hang around. Yeah, it's kind of scary. So, so he could have more time than we're actually giving him credit for. We should probably yeah. be careful. Yeah, right. So that was an interesting way of going about that part of it with the bullet points. I mean, we get just so much more of a taste of what's going on out there. I'm not yeah. sure that we want it, but I... we sure as hell got it. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so what else have you got for us tonight? Well, in this again news, we have right-wing pastor Perry Stone, who said on his live stream that we don't have to worry about climate change or environmental issues because Jesus will fix all that when he comes back. But... Why? That's my question. Why fix it? Aren't we getting a new heaven and a new earth? Right. What, what is there to fix at that point? I, I don't know, but this is not a new attitude. 
No, of course not. When I was in the evangelical church, I would hear guys say these things constantly. And I heard it too. We've talked about it before on the show. That one couple in particular that my mother knew, their house was literally falling apart and they didn't care because because Jesus was coming back. There was no reason to store up treasures on earth anymore. He was going to come back before the decade was out. Uh And that was the mid 80s. Yep. Oh, they really believed it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Oh, they still yeah. do. They still do. But when half the country is burning and the other half is coughing with the smoke from said fires. Yeah, we know a thing or two about that around yeah, here. Yeah, we do. It starts feeling a little more serious. A little more. Many other pastors, some of whom we've discussed in this segment, have said similar things. Pastor John MacArthur of Grace Community Church in California has said God meant us to use this planet. It is disposable. Okay, can I have chapter and verse on that? Yeah, right? I I know. Immediately, I think of heaven and earth will pass away. But, I mean, with all due respect, we still have to live here. Right. In the interim. And there's nothing. I mean, no man is supposed to know the day or the hour, right? So you don't know. So you just keep doing what you're doing. So don't don't throw it away just yet. Yeah, Yeah, right. Ken Ham once said that the only climate change you need to worry about is going to hell. Because, of course, he did. And this is the same guy who has a sign up in his Ark Encounter exhibition that says, quote, if I can convince you that the flood was not real, I can convince you that heaven and hell are not real. Mm. This is at the Ark Encounter. Okay. (laughs) Well, good, Ken, because if that's true... I have some pretty solid evidence from geology, anthropology, and a half dozen other ologies and observable evidences that amply prove that no such fucking thing ever actually happened. Mm -hmm. It's an observable impossibility. So by virtue of his own words on this subject, I would have to conclude that hell isn't something I need to worry about. So can we get back to strategizing how to impede climate change now? Yeah, right. Is that something we can just that would be nice. do that at this would point? Be great. And Pastor Mark Driscoll mentioned that he knows who created everything, and he's coming back to burn it all up. Isn't that lovely? More of that Such violent lovely. imagery. That yeah, that lovely violent evangelical imagery that they love to pull out to make their point just a little bit clearer. Yeah, because when you're part of a religion that packages love as hate then you have to get a little aggressive once in a while with the way that you express things. Yeah. And even elected Republicans say that God will fix everything. No one talks about how God basically said in various verses in Genesis, uh, there's one in Numbers, and there's a few in the New Testament. He basically said we need to take care of the planet. That's why he kind of created us. Mm Mm-hmm. We were supposed to be custodians. Right. We were supposed to go into the world and subdue it or whatever the words say. It said you will have dominion over everything. Right. But you're supposed to take care of it. You're supposed to be a good steward of what God has given you. Isn't there a parable about how you should do that or God is not going to be happy with you? There are a couple that follow that particular line of thought. Yes. Right. But, you know, that would require them to think about people other than themselves. And they're not good at that. They really aren't. No, they've, they've never been, and they never will be. It's all about what's important to them and what matters at that moment. And it's always been that way. And it's always going to be that way, because that's the type of people that they are. And they're not going to change. And that's why, that's why we're here doing what we're doing. Because we know they're not going to change. It's up to us to be the counterpoint to the points that they're making and make sure that the the logic and the reason and the actual intelligent thought gets out there. Because it's never going to come from them. And the people that listen to them aren't going to hear it from within the circles that they are in right now. That's why it's so important for us to keep doing what we're doing and help people get and stay unbound. Yeah. It's because of stuff like this, all this craziness yeah. that we're talking about tonight. These are, as I've said many times before, in my astonished voice, these are grown-ups. These yeah. are adult people who believe these things. 
how do you get to be a certain age and still believe this stuff? Yeah. It makes no sense. I can't even piece it together in my brain. And I was as pickled on the Kool-Aid as any of them. Mm-hmm. And next and finally, more dumb Christians spinning lies about the COVID vaccine. The right-wing legal group, Liberty Council, has been spreading lies about COVID as much as they can, considering their members are gullible and have no critical thinking skills. So they're average evangelicals. Right. Got it. Liberty Council's vice president of media, Holly Mead, claimed the vaccines contain graphene oxide for the purpose of controlling people and linking them to the Internet. Here we go again. Of course, she has no scientific credentials whatsoever. Because of course she doesn't. Of course not. You don't need credentials to have these opinions and have people follow them when evangelicals are your target audience. Yeah. Who knows where she got that information? Was it from a disgruntled employee who was spreading disinformation, even though they were nowhere around the development of the vaccine? Who knows? And honestly, in Liberty Council's opinion, who cares? The main thing they're trying to do is spread doubt, and evangelical Christians are the sort that take Liberty Council's uninformed opinions and words seriously. They already don't believe COVID is really a thing, that it's a plot by the leftists to control everyone by apparently hooking us up to the internet? It's the, isn't it the Bill Gates thing again? You yeah, know, it's all that. Everyone being microchipped. Yeah, we're all being microchipped and connected to the internet, I, apparently. I have news for you, people. You're already connected to the internet. Yeah. Whether you want to think about it that way or not. Maybe right. it's not a direct line to your brain or to your body. Right. But I'm sorry. We Most of us right. carry these devices with us all the time that have us connected these devices know where we are. Mm -hmm. They know where we've been. They know things that I find very unnerving. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't want to spread tinfoil hat paranoia mm -hmm. over anything, but even I have to admit that there have been times when I've been very surprised at some of the ads yeah. that have shown up in my Facebook feed mm -hmm. after I've had conversations yeah. with people about things. It really makes you wonder how much these devices are actually listening to us yeah. and i'm not going to get into conspiracy theory no. it could be nothing but cosmic coincidence and this i is know true. It. i know it mm -hmm. but i also know what technology is capable of yeah and it makes it just a little bit scary to think about at times yeah i mean honestly i'm looking for the conspiracy theory about the perpetual motion machines that control the weather next that's been an old conspiracy theory. I heard that when I was a kid. Right. The Ruskies have a perpetual motion machine that's controlling yeah. the weather. Yeah, it was the Russians back during the Cold War. Yeah. And it'll be anything that these people want it to be once they figure out a way to fit it back into their narrative. Yeah, and it's really disturbing. Honestly, I'm just, I'm very disturbed about everything coming from that side of the aisle. It's, it's crazy. It is. But let's not forget one crucial element to all of this. That is that their numbers are, in fact, decreasing. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not like they're building this juggernaut and more and more people every day are coming around to their way of thinking. No, they are losing ground and they know it. And that's why, I believe, anyway, that's why things are becoming as crazy as they are. Right. Because they're desperate. And... The desperation that they feel is coming out in everything that they do. It hit a crescendo with the last election. Yeah. But we're going to see aftershocks of that that are going to continue for a long time. And we're going to see new things cropping up. New avenues of alarmism that yeah. they can use to rile people up. And especially those who are already prone to agreeing with them. Right. And seeing their point of view. They're going to do everything in their power to cater to these people. They're going to do everything in their power to scare the living shit out of these people so that it keeps them in line. Right. And keeps them listening. And that right there is actually a good segue into what we're going to be talking about right. tonight. But before we get into that, I just want to let you know that our Patreon is live at patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network. Um, starting at five bucks a month, just over a buck an episode. If you value what we're doing here and would like to see it continue, 
then please consider supporting our Patreon. You'll be doing a lot of good for us and for the show, helping us do more with the show as we go along, and also helping more people get and stay unbound. That, to me, is the most important part of this. If you don't have the means to help us financially, then again, just like I say every single week, tell someone new about the show this week. Tell someone that you know will be able to benefit from it or who will at least be able to listen to it and relate. Leave those five-star ratings. Leave some good reviews. All of the things right. that we do in social media land. Just <laughs> help us out with that. You know what our needs are, and you know how you can help us meet those needs. Whether you have money or no money, there are things that we can all do to keep this thing moving forward. And speaking of moving forward, let's get right into our main topic. So we're talking primarily tonight about the subject of religious trauma syndrome. That kind of became the focal point of this, but I want to restart the clock from where we stopped it last week and look just for a couple of minutes at some of the questions that go through people's minds when they stop going to church. Now, last week we talked about my four Sunday challenge where you just quit church cold turkey, figure out some more cool things to do with your time on Sunday and get used to being able to just have that day for you. And here's what happened to me, and I know this is what happens with a lot of people, after you've been out for a while. Now remember, I also said that once you get through that first four weeks, reset the clock and go for another four. Well, after you go through a couple of these cycles, I think that this is what you're going to find starts to happen. You'll start questioning a lot. And those questions will take the form of things like, why did I believe this for so long? Yeah. Uh, that was a big one for me. Mm. Like, what was it about this? There's nothing that's really appealing about it. That's the crazy part. There's the emotionalism and sensationalism that they pepper the whole thing with to keep your interest. But at the end of the day, there's so little to this and there's so little to like about it that yeah. it really makes a person wonder how this thing could ensnare someone, a smart person, two smart people. We're very yeah. smart people. You and I got some brains <laughs> between us. But what is it that kept us mm. for so long? I cannot put my finger on a single thing that was good enough for me to give two and a half decades of my life to it. Yeah, I can't come up with one single solitary thing. And the next thing that I brainstormed on this was what really matters to me? What has real significance in my life? Because for the longest time, it all revolved around Jesus. It all revolved around concepts like, I have to decrease so he can increase. Right. Well, it never occurred to me when I was in to think terribly long about what really matters to me. Because the only thing that mattered to me was doing what God wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was that way for a very, very long time. I didn't make decisions on my own. Right. I didn't make what I considered to be independent choices. I made choices based on what I believed God wanted. And that was most of my experience in that. Most of the time that I was in, that was what drove my thoughts. Not what I wanted, not what I felt would be best for me, but what he wanted. Right. I mean, again, abusive relationships 101. Mm -hmm. And then, and I think this kind of follows along with the first one a little bit. Did I really like going to church? Did I like going to church? Yeah, no, not really. To be perfectly honest, I didn't like going to church. I liked being involved in church. Right. I liked when I was part of the music ministry. I liked when I was in the Episcopal church and I was doing the readings and mm -hmm. I was the communion acolyte. I liked that. I liked having something to do. Mm -hmm. But a church service in and of itself, I could take or leave. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I could take it or leave it. There were a lot of Sundays especially as a teenager, when I knew that I had friends that were out doing other things and I was sitting there in church. And, you know, the crazy part about it is that I can't tell you, sitting here tonight, I cannot tell you what the topic of any sermon was nope. that I ever heard in that AG church. Nope. And I sat through a lot of sermons mm. in that church between our senior pastor and what happened in youth group on Fridays, I cannot pinpoint a single sermon that I would consider to be memorable. Right. I mean, most of it is gone. Oh, yeah. 
as Definitely. good riddance. But yeah. you would think that in that amount of time, you would find something where you would have some point of relatability. And I flat out never found that. No. I mean, I was told how to feel about certain things. And I had my emotions riled up many, many, many times. But I can remember the emotional responses, but I can't right. remember what elicited them no. at all. Nope. I mean, there are moments. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are definitely moments I can remember parts of sermons, especially from camps. Camp right. was a bigger thing for me than church. So a lot of the memories that I have are more focused on Word of Life and even the AG Youth Camp. I have more vivid memories of that, but they're still snippets. They're like sentences and themes that may not have even been the main theme of the message that my brain just latched onto. But for the most part, it's gone. I mean, I can't tell you. I cannot give you the title of a single sermon that our senior pastor delivered. I could if I had the notion to go digging for my old notebooks because one of the things that I did for quite a while was sit and take notes on those sermons. And that lot of good that did because I don't remember them nope. at all. Not at all. And the next question is, you know, kind of on the uh, subject of the bleeding obvious. Why did I ever believe any of this? Not that I, not why did I believe for so long, but why did I believe it in the first place? Right. Because when you step back from all of that crazy thinking and indoctrination nothing about this religion makes any sense whatsoever and you know i'm gonna mess this up but i'm gonna give it a try anyway uh, one of my favorite memes about this defines christianity as basically a religion around a reanimated zombie who is his own father yep who died on a cross to save the world from sin because a girl ate an apple given to her by a talking snake. Yeah. Tell me what part of that is inaccurate. No. Nope. That there's, there's nothing in that statement that's remotely inaccurate. So when you look at it, when you break it down to brass tacks and you understand that this is what your faith was, you're going to look at it and say, seriously, what yeah. the fuck? Why <laughs> on earth? Did I ever believe any of this shit? But the problem is, it's very tenacious. Right. And it has a siren song about it that will draw you in and keep you in for a very, very long time for reasons that I've gone over ad nauseum on this show, mostly having to do with acceptance. For me, anyway, it had a lot to do with acceptance. And it was a place where pretty much everyone was supposed to be allowed to fit in. We didn't have any identity, Mm -hmm. But we fit in. Yeah. We sure as fuck fit in. But there were also things that I noticed beyond the questions, beyond the how can I be so dumb kind of things that go through your mind when you start thinking a little bit more clearly. There were things that I noticed when I got out of the habit of going to church. For starters, I know I was thinking a lot more clearly. Right. I was still depressed. I've always been depressed. Didn't realize it for years and years. Mm -hmm. But even in the midst of all of that murky thinking, there was more clarity with right. that stuff out of the way. Now, know what I said more clearly, not clearly. Right. Because clearly is a process. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I'm there yet. No. But yeah. at this point in time, I can tell you, I see through much more than a glass darkly with this. Definitely. I see a lot more than I ever would have if I had spent more time in it. That's for sure. I also started questioning things that it never occurred to me to question before. Like the whole concept of the needle in the haystack. I've brought this up. I don't know if I brought it up on the show, but I know that I've mm -hmm. brought it up in conversation a lot of times where it seems a little bit unfair that a God who is supposed to love everybody equally on this planet right. would take this thing called Christianity and hide it like a needle in a haystack for people to find. Okay. You have right. to find Jesus. Okay. Okay. Now, if you're from a part of the world that isn't going to be able to conceptualize what Christianity is, and there are plenty of people out there that can't even begin to conceptualize a Western spiritual view, right. okay, what about them? Why would God do this to people that he's alleged to love? He creates this system where there are so many thousands of religions, and they all find their way into this haystack. Right. And your job is to find the needle that's going to get you to him. 
not even just one needle in the haystack. Yeah. Take the thousands and thousands of religions that are out there, and each one of them has their own needle. Yeah. Okay? So even if you find a needle in the haystack, how do you know it's going to be the right one? No, you don't. And, and you don't. And most people wouldn't recognize it if they saw it because their brains are not made or programmed to think that way. Right. Their brains are not programmed to think about Christianity or about religion or spirituality from a Western perspective at all. So right. that's problematic. I'm going to get back to that point in just a sec. The next thing that I really started contemplating, why is it that God sent Jesus to die so that he could have fellowship with us when he clearly interacted far more directly with people in the Old Testament? Yeah, that is crazy. I couldn't get a straight answer to this question from any professor at that sorry excuse for a college. They didn't want to fudge it. No, because like they, they didn't do want to some think things. about it. No. And it's, it was one of those things that there's no way to weasel out of this one. In the Old Testament, God is interacting with humanity. And then you get saved or you listen to the sales pitch before you get saved. <laughs> and you're told that Jesus had to die so that God could have fellowship with humanity. Well, where the fuck is he? Yeah. I mean, he talked directly to Moses and the prophets. And this was long before the atonement. Where the fuck is he? Yeah, good question. He wanted fellowship with us, but now he's decided, yeah, well, I'm just going to go over here and do my thing and let the world burn. Is that what happened? And if so, why couldn't he just be honest with us about it? The next question that I had was, where is God in the lives of people, really? Yeah. Because... I keep thinking about this over and over and over again. I can't get it out of my head that in the time that it takes me to just get through one of these bullet points, somewhere in the world, some kid has died of starvation. Yeah. And his eye is supposed to be on the sparrow. That's the, the rosy picture that's been painted in my head for what this miscreant of a deity is actually like when he's nothing like that right. at all. Where is he in those situations? We also know that he's capable of raining down manna from heaven and making quail appear out of nowhere so that people right. can eat. So where are these children's... Where, where is his mind when these children are dying of starvation? I'll ask it again. Where the fuck is he? Yeah. And you can't come up with an answer right. to that question. There's, there's no way to get around that. And the next thing that started running through my head was how could there be only one way to God when people around the world view and practice spirituality so differently and worship so many different gods? There are so many out there. Where did these all come from? If he wanted to be known and he wanted to be the only one and he wanted all of the focus to be on him, you think he could have advertised himself a little bit better yeah. and continued to advertise himself just a little bit better throughout the centuries. I mean, to me, it makes sense. Right. If you want to be known, if you are the creator of the universe and you're real, why would you hide? Why would you hide from the people that you want to have fellowship with? Right. That makes no sense. Zero. Zip. Nada. No sense whatsoever. So the only conclusion that I can draw from that is that these were nothing but stories. And, right. and with all due respect, you talk to a lot of Jewish scholars and they will tell you that these stories were never meant to be taken literally. They were never meant to be right. taken as this actually happened. These people lived and these miracles took place and all of that. All of it was supposed to teach us about ourselves. That's what all of these things were designed to do, right. was teach us about ourselves from the perspective of a Bronze Age human who didn't have the benefit of science or psychology to be able to draw from or glean information from. They had very limited resources, but this was their attempt at explaining us and who we are. Every personality type that you can think of is in the Bible. Yeah. Every psychiatric scenario, mm. every psychological scenario that you can think of, it all happens in the Bible. The problem is they knew how to write stories about it, but they didn't understand it. Right. Of course not. That was the problem. 
another thing that I noticed was that not going to church normalized pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. It really wasn't this thing where I sat around wondering what songs were being sung in the worship service this week. I never spent five minutes on that. Right. You know, I, I missed it so bad that I literally stopped thinking about it pretty much as soon as I stopped going. Yeah. I missed it. And there were moments where I thought maybe it might be nice to do this once in a while. You know, it's like I was talking about last week. Every now and right. then, you like like with the cigarettes, okay? Mm-hmm. Like me with cigarettes, every now and then, I get a craving for one. I had one of my coworkers was smoking today. And I came this close, this close to asking if I could bum one, and I didn't. But, good. oh yeah, it's, it's good. I've, I've only slipped once. <laughs> In four months, I've slipped once. Yeah. So I started thinking about church in kind of the same terms you know every now and then it might be nice Mm -hmm. but it never materialized i was never motivated enough to darken the doors of another church and thank goodness i didn't because it really just you know at that point i knew what i believed at least to the extent that i was in wicca and had all of these new beliefs but there were elements of a normal quote-unquote normal church service that were absent in ritual right. that I thought would be interesting to revisit from time to time. And it never materialized. And it didn't need to. And by the time I got through my stint with Wicca, I really wasn't interested in it at all anymore. Right. And along those lines, I started realizing how much fun it all wasn't. Yeah. It really wasn't all that fun. It was burdensome. The number of times that I had to drag my ass to church Mm -hmm. during the course of a given week, it was burdensome. I've gone through what, at the height of it, it looks like and how I was there almost every night of the week. Yeah. And, I mean, it had consumed my life. As an older teenager, 16, 17-ish years old, it had consumed my life. I mean, if I thought about it, I think maybe, maybe one night out of the week I wasn't there. Yeah. And that was it. Mm. And I'm not even talking just weekdays. I'm talking about the entire week. Let's think about twice on Sunday. Let's think about youth group on Friday. Let's think about the infamous peer care on yeah. Thursday. Oh, man. I, you know, I'm, I'm so tempted to go into that story again because I know there are people who don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But... You can go back to our series on youth ministry, the youth ministry agenda, and you'll hear all about that and in a couple of other places, too. But none of it was fun. I'm just going to go on record. Youth group and the social part of it was fun. There were elements of every service that I enjoyed, especially the music. But at the end of the day, there were more Sundays where I didn't feel motivated to get out of bed. And go to church, not just because I'd been up watching Headbangers Ball until 2.30, which I had, (laughs) but there there, there was very little motivation. I didn't really get anything out of it personally. The only thing that I got out of it after some time had passed was the little bit of an ego boost because I had all these people around me telling me how wonderful I was and how great it was that I had been called into the ministry and how talented I was. And, you know, I could go to church and get my ego stroked, and that was nice. But yeah. church itself wasn't. Church itself kind of sucked, especially the one that we went to because it was only at the late stages when we were on our way out that they started modernizing things a little bit. Our senior pastor was really, really into the hymns and didn't want modern worship music until he couldn't avoid it anymore, until the hymns couldn't keep people in the seats anymore. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, we woke up and smelled the late 20th century. Mm-hmm. That's when it happened. It was when he realized that the church hadn't grown in a couple of years. Yeah. And it was time for a change. And his thinking about a lot of things was incredibly backward. Even during my internship, I saw how backward his thinking was about a lot of things. And when he finally gave in and allowed us to have a worship band in the Sunday morning service, I promise you it was because tithes were decreasing. Yeah. And it didn't have anything to do with personal convictions. It had to do with that and very, very little else. But those were actually the positives of this. And there were negative aspects to all of the positives, too. But those were really actually good things that happened as a result of this. I started thinking in the right direction about a lot of things. And I started questioning a lot of the right things. 
but there were negatives. And I'm going to get into some of those now. So brace yourselves. We're all about the truth here. And the truth isn't always pretty. It usually isn't. Sometimes the truth is downright ugly. And so here comes some ugly truths about what happens when you leave. For starters, I realized right off the bat that I had lost the focus of all of my creative outlets. I had done music in every church that I had been involved in. Yeah. I had been part of the music ministry in almost every church. There's only one that I can think of off the top of my head where I spent most of my time in the pew. But in most cases, I showed up in town and the right people caught wind that I had musical talent and that was the end of that. Yeah. I was in the music ministry. And I had actually written a number of worship songs that, you know, it makes me cringe to think about it. But even though it was a few years ago now, it was still decades after these songs were written. And I wound up in a church service at Faith Assembly. And there goes one of my songs up there on the on the screen. Oh, boy. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. They're still singing this song. They still don't know who wrote it because my name was nowhere on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, they're still stuck on this. It's been two decades and they're still stuck on, well, not two decades, maybe a decade and a half or so, but they were still stuck on the same songs, which was, I mean, it was jaw dropping for me when I saw that, but I did other things too. I wrote skits for youth group, teen talent and all of that stuff. I put a lot of my creative self into the things that went on in church and my faith and my sense of creativity were tied very, very closely together. And now all of a sudden I find myself in a situation where I don't have that outlet anymore. I can't pull out my guitar and play and sing for people every week anymore. And that is one part that I actually did miss. Like I said, I missed being involved in church, but church itself I could take or leave. And then it occurred to me that I would probably lose and had rapidly actually lost a lot of people that I cared about. They were all suddenly not part of my peer group anymore because we didn't have this as the thing that bound us together. When it really hit me that I was out of this and that I didn't identify with these people anymore, the thing that hurt the most was the fact that that also included Vienne and Trestius. Yeah. Because if you go back to episode 50, you're going to hear a lot about those two organizations and why I would miss them so badly. And, you know, I, I can't think of a single person in that, in either of those movements that I still talk to. Oh no. And it sucks. I mean, there are a couple from that time in my life, but no one from that movement. And, and I've said before, these were some of the best people in terms of if you're, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going, if you're going to be an evangelical, this is the right way to do it. And a lot of them were part of these organizations. And it occurred to me that I would never get along with them anymore. There were no points of relatability with them anymore. And I wouldn't just shove them out of my life. They just sort of left by the natural course of events Because I wasn't involved anymore and I wasn't there and I wasn't part of that process anymore. So, you know, it just sort of happened that I fell out and no one really noticed. And and you see, when I, when I think about how awesome I thought that whole thing was, that's an important point is that I fell out. And even though I'd been heavily involved with it for the number of years that I had been, I don't think that anyone ever quote unquote checked up on me. Nope. Not a single one. So, you know, they may have been some of the good eggs, but as soon as you lose that point of relatability in a community like that, then it's like you never existed in the first place. It's like everything that you gave to it really just didn't matter. And I've come to grips with the fact that it really didn't matter. I mean, what good was I doing for people? Yeah. Being part of that. But... It bothers me because these were good people mm-hmm. oh, and, yeah. and I didn't want to lose them. And I recognized that when I gave this up, that I was giving them up too, or I, I realized it later. It wasn't yeah. even, that wasn't even part of the equation until I thought about it later. But when I gave this up, I gave them up and it hurt when it finally struck me. It did actually hurt 
in the context of those organizations in particular. Yeah. I had lost the acceptance and respect of a lot of my peers, including my best friend in high school. We don't get along. We can't talk. Yeah. There's just, there's too much of a disconnect. She is still very much in the Kool-Aid and I am very, very much not. And even when I was kind of on my way out and on the fence, there were points of disagreement that I knew would keep us from being friends anymore. And that sucked. I felt very alone. I've never been quote unquote popular, but I had more friends then. And it was easier to maintain those relationships when I at least had enough of an anchor where people thought that I was still part of this, that I still believed it. And I let them believe that I still believed it for a long time to be able to maintain those ties. But after a while, everything comes out in the wash. Yeah. And it became apparent to a lot of people that this wasn't me anymore. And the vast majority of them just disappeared. We did an entire episode on this one. I lost the luxury of prayer. Yeah. And even now, even recently, within the past week or two, that thought has jumped into my mind where I just wanted to pray over a situation or over a person or whatever it was. And there was one specific thing this week that I'm not going to get into just because it was very personal. But I found it interesting that the very first thing that I thought of when I heard this particular piece of news was that I wanted to pray for the person that was involved. Yeah. It just jumped right back into my head. And it's like, dude, just text her and just let her know that you're there and provide some comfort. I mean, that's going to do way more than you getting on your knees and talking into nothing. Yeah. But losing the luxury of prayer is difficult and we have an entire episode on that that goes through the psychology of it and why you still want to pray when you get out of this it's not something that goes away anytime soon i mean i'm as atheist as they come and that thought crept into my head less than a week ago so you know it can it can happen and it can keep happening for a long time and this is a huge part of religious trauma syndrome that i'm not getting into a whole lot of because we've done content on the subject also, but I couldn't stop believing in hell. And if you are having this issue, then we have an entire episode on hell, where the concept actually came from, and just how nutsy cuckoo it is to think that this is a real place. So it helps. And of course, doing the research for that show was very cathartic for me, because this is something that I still, to this day, struggle with those thoughts still find their way in. And it's like, well, what if you're wrong? And that leads me to my next point. I kept playing Pascal's wager in my head and it looked good for a really, really long time. It looked good because it was anchored to that tenacious belief in hell. Right. It's not like it was always in the front of my mind, but the what ifs can really drive you nuts if you let them. Oh yeah. So, That's why I say it's so important to do your best to let go and really attack these thoughts with logic and reason when they show up. It's a very simplistic way of approaching this particular thing, but it's not that much more involved than just telling yourself, look, you know that this is silly yeah, and it's time to stop worrying about it because there's no evidence that any of this is true. And this is the one thing that you're going to linger on. Well, guess what? It's the one thing that a lot of people linger on. And it's one of the main things that makes them fail the four Sunday challenge. They start thinking, you know, God's not happy with me. And they go back and they repent and they rededicate their lives to the Lord. This happens all the time. We're encouraged to do it all the time. And a huge portion of it, comes back to this belief in hell whether it's an active thing or if it's just something that lurks in the back of your mind and comes out at those inopportune moments it's still there for a lot of people it stays for a long 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 time so many of these things stay for a long time and that's why there are designations like religious trauma syndrome 
that we're going to get into a little bit more in depth in a minute. And then I came to the realization that what I had always suspected about death was almost certainly true. Right. Because there was a part of me that always had a hard time with believing in the concept of an afterlife. Right. And there was a part of me that really started questioning whether or not I wanted to go to the Christian heaven because I saw way, way earlier on than when I became an atheist what that place was actually like and what my eternity would actually be. And it didn't look good. It didn't look good to me at all. But the notion of non-existence right. didn't look that great either. <laughs> so, you know, what's the worst fate? Well, we talked about it last week was the whole concept of, okay, you can have 75 years that are yours and you can do what you want with them and you can explore all of these things and you can live the abundant life that your faith is supposed to give you but can't. Right. You can do that or you can live for 2 million years but never leave your house. Yeah. So that, you know, again, what's the worst fate? You know, for me, I'd rather have the 75 years and amass those experiences. And even though it probably won't matter at all when I'm gone. Right. It won't matter to me anyway when I'm gone. Um, I'm here now. And right. my brain doesn't know. what My brain doesn't know how to be dead. My brain has been alive from its beginning. So it doesn't know how to be dead. And I can only imagine that it's not going to matter. Right. But what matters is now, because right now I'm sitting here and I'm saying these words and I'm looking at this screen and I'm alive right now. I have a responsibility to do something about that. That's the way that I choose to look at it now. But the whole concept of your own mortality is a difficult one. And again, we got a whole episode on that. Yeah. And here's the crazy part. I knew that I was right. When I left, I knew that I was right. But I took no comfort and being right. right. Because what about the last two and a half decades of my life? Yeah. What exactly do I do to account to myself for all of that? What do I do to tell myself and convince myself that it's okay? Yeah. And that's, that's a tough one. That is. And it made me feel very alone. It made me feel swindled. And it made me feel like a fucking idiot. Because I just can't imagine with the brain that I have to think with now how anyone survives that for two and a half decades and there are people that stay in it for much much yeah. much much longer and that's even scarier but in terms of me and my own life and my own responsibility to myself it can be rage inducing to think of the amount of time that was lost but going right back to episode one, you got to let go. Mm -hmm. You've got to let go of the time lost and understand that, yeah, this is something that happened. But we move forward. We don't move backward. We can't change what was, but we can change what is and we can change what will be. Right. So and we have and that is our responsibility. The past, we we have no control over that. We have control over now and we have control over what happens tomorrow if we're granted a tomorrow. So to me, there's a sense of urgency to live and to do good things with the life that I have yeah. because I only get the one that I'm aware of. This era was part of it, but it's over now. And I'm thinking clearly and thank whatever you want to thank that I got out. Yeah. You know, thank, thank me, thank myself, <laughs> thank myself because I listened to my brain. I listened to my rational brain. It said, get out and it may have screamed at me for a couple of decades, but I finally, but I finally listened. And yeah. that's what matters. That's what counts. All of this is a cocktail of thought processes that blends neatly into a case of religious trauma syndrome or RTS. All of the good meshed with all of the bad. While RTS is still not an official mental health diagnosis, it is taken seriously within the mental health community. It's a subject that, in scientific terms, is currently under basically peer review. Right. RTS is believed to be on the spectrum of post-traumatic stress disorder and related illnesses. Now, all of those things, all of those bullet points that I went through were just the product of what I brainstormed out of my own head. Then I found an article on restorationcounselingseattle.com 
and found a whole other list with both similarities to what I came up with, along with several memory joggers that I'd like to share. Now, before I do that, I just want to add a little disclaimer here. I'm not citing restoration counseling or any other cited source in this episode as a reputable source of therapy or treatment for RTS. This is blog content that I'm getting a lot of this from, and it shows up on independent websites that contain some good information. I'm going to make the disclaimer and urge you to properly vet any and all parties who provide you with mental health services and never confuse blogging with peer-reviewed documentation. There are questionable treatment programs out there for this with all the earmarks of someone cashing in on a current mental health trend. And every one of these organizations has their own blog. So be careful where you get your information from. And be careful who you seek out for help. Evidence of this disorder is largely anecdotal, but it has a number of commonly observed symptoms that nearly always show up together. To be clear, Religious trauma syndrome is not found in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. No mental health professional is going to officially diagnose you with this, but they will tell you if your symptoms line up with those of what is currently defined as RTS. RTS is not pseudoscience, like, say, subluxation or reflexology or anything else that you can name that falls under that category. Um, To quote the article, Religious Trauma Syndrome is in the early stages of research and is gaining traction as a legitimate diagnosis. Now, some of the symptoms commonly experienced by people suffering from religious trauma syndrome include, this is from my curated list, not the one that I brainstormed. There are going to be some similarities. Right. Confusing thoughts and reduced ability to think critically. Well, when you're in a religion that's all about trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Mm. That's the type of thing that happens. Negative beliefs about self, others, and the world. And we just talked about this during our Christians behaving badly. The world is expendable. Jesus is coming back. Why do we have to worry about storing up our treasures on earth? There's something so much better right around the corner. And that breeds negative beliefs about everything. If it's all expendable, then there's no value to any of it. Right. So why should we value the things that we do? Well, we value them because we live in this very physical, very material world. And we need these things to be able to survive. We need our house to be in good order. We need to keep up with the things that keep us with that roof over our heads without it leaking on us. Yeah. You know, we've got to be responsible. But when you've been drunk on the Kool-Aid for too long, then these things lose their value in your head. And that's a big problem. Trouble making decisions. Um, Well, yeah, you're in a religion that doesn't teach you to think for yourself. As a matter of fact, it discourages you from thinking for yourself. So of course you're going to have trouble making decisions about anything, but especially about things that you've equated with sin. Right. It's going to be real difficult for you to reconcile things that you considered to be Mm -hmm. sinful when you were in this thing. Feelings of depression and anxiety, most of which are over things like hell. And yeah. then there's grief, or I, I put the note in there, the truth about death. You talked about this a long oh, yeah. time ago, where once you came to the realization of what death is, you had to regrieve yeah. for a lot of people. And I had to regrieve for a lot of people and yeah. come to the realization that it's done. These yeah. people do not exist anymore, and I'm not going to see them again. Right. It was difficult, but necessary. Definitely. Then there's feelings of anger, both at yourself and the system. And yes, let's, let's be real, sometimes the people, and that's okay. You know, I talk about not getting angry at the people, getting angry at the system that created them. Yeah. There's, there are people I'm angry at. Yeah. You know, most of them affiliated with Mission Impossible. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but there there are others, too. Yeah. And, I, and I, I readily admit to being angry at certain people, which, you know, sometimes it's warranted. I'm mm-hmm. just, just putting that out there. Not all the time. Usually it's a better idea to direct your anger at the system. But there are some people out there that you, you know, I'm sorry, you really should know better just on the basis of how you treat people as human beings. You should know better. Forget about your religion. How do you treat people when you're not using your God as a basis for how to treat them? Right. 
then there's that sense of feeling lost. Oh, God, I know what that's all yeah. about. Lost, directionless, and alone. You know, that happens when you come to the realization that everything that you knew and believed was a lie. And when you come to that realization, certain people are, aren't going to want to be around you anymore. And things can get very lonely yeah. very, very, very quickly. And yes, I totally and completely felt lost, even the first time. The first time that I walked away from this, remember what I said to my grandmother about, you know, I don't think I believe this anymore. And I'm scared to death because I don't know what I'm going to do without it. That is what's called feeling lost. Yeah. And the only way back. And oh, my God, that that Petra song. I think it goes. You say you've walked a thousand steps away, but don't you know it's only one step back? Yeah. Well, you know what? That stuck in my head for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. And during that six-month period where I wasn't going to church, it was that sentiment and that song that kept running through my head. And I won't say it single-handedly drew me back, but it wouldn't leave my head. Yeah. And the words to that song, they just kept coming back to me. And I can remember thinking about that when I was getting dressed to go back to church that first time. Some people experience a lack of pleasure or interest in things they used to enjoy. I can't pinpoint any personal examples of this yeah. because I honestly didn't have that many interests outside of church. I had to start developing new ones. Yeah. So it wasn't really a matter of a lack of pleasure in things that I used to enjoy. It was more a matter of what the fuck do I do with myself now? Yeah. That was more of it for me. We've talked at length about the loss of community aspect of this, where you make friends and acquaintances and all of your social everything revolves around church. And now you have to figure out ways to replace that. And that yeah. is not fun. It's possible, but it's a process. And yeah. I can tell you from experience, it's fun once you find yourself in something that you like and enjoy and you're around people that you enjoy but getting there can be an arduous task. I'm just going to be blunt and honest about it. It can be difficult, yeah. but it is not impossible. It's just a matter of making the decision to do it and then being patient enough to find the right circles for you to move in. That's really what it comes down to. This one, let me tell you, feeling <laughs> behind the times with cultural happenings of, like music, for example, I have something that I want to say on the subject of music that I'm going to get to in just a couple of minutes. But there are also many other symptoms that run parallel with PTSD yeah. that are found in religious trauma syndrome, including nightmares, mostly having to do with hell or people who have passed on unsaved loved ones that you see in hell in your dreams, that sort of thing. Yeah. I've heard a lot of stories about those kinds of dreams. Flashbacks. Well, yeah, I've had very positive and very negative flashbacks of things that have happened in church. Yeah. Interactions with people, various circumstances. Oh, yeah, there are things that still come flooding back into my head from time to time. Then they talk about disassociation or emotional difficulty. That can happen. This is why last week I talked about having a strategy and having a plan yeah. and not just sitting there and looking out the window and wondering what song they're singing during the worship service. <laughs> you have to have a plan. You have to be able to replace this thing with something more positive or that disassociation can become problematic for you. It might anyway. I'm not going to say that that's the be all end all is to do what I said in a podcast episode. You still could go through that. But it's far worse if you just quit this thing cold turkey and sit there, woe is me, your way through it. Yeah. That's where you start finding difficulty. And then there's the concept of emotional difficulty that goes along with this. Yeah. And let me tell you, there are things, there are triggers, things that I hear now, mm -hmm. things that I remember from back in the day that are serious triggers. Worship music oh, is a big yeah. trigger for me, especially songs with particularly overwrought lyrics like basically all things Hill songs. Oh, yeah. But there are a couple of them in particular that I think about now, and they have a dual effect on me. First, they tug at my heartstrings, yep. and then they make me angry for tugging at my heartstrings. <laughs> okay? yeah. That's most of it. 
Then there's listening to certain televangelists and self-proclaimed prophets or having to hear even small excerpts of sermons that have a certain tone and pace. And it's Ugh. very difficult to articulate yeah. this, but I think there are going to be people out there that understand what I'm talking about with that, yeah. where there's just a certain kind of preaching that is very typical to the more nutty end of evangelicalism. Yes. So when I hear that kind of preaching, which I've had to hear numerous times just in preparing some of these episodes and also on other podcasts when yeah. they play sound clips and whatnot, there can be, it can have a very triggering effect. Yeah. If it sounds a certain way, if it's paced a certain way. Yeah. And yeah, it's hard to articulate, but I'll bet you anything that there are people out there saying, yep, I get you, Spider. I know that there are people out there yeah. that know what I'm talking about with this. Yeah. There's just something about the delivery that makes my skin crawl every yes. single time. Yeah, same, same. That just drives me nuts. Um, the last time I think I was in a evangelical service, it was probably at your grandmother's funeral. Yeah. And it was really hard to sit through. Oh, yes. And we were up front, so I can I couldn't move. Yeah, yeah, we we were kind of a captive audience there. Yeah, and I was like, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. There's that type of thing. But there's also, you know, certain songs, uh, certain hymns like Amazing Grace. I have a hard time with that one. Because they would sing it, and they would extend the singing of that song ad nauseum. Yeah, 17 verses of Praise God, Praise God. Yes, it used to drive me a little crazy when I was in it. And now it just, I, it's intolerable. Yeah. Oh, no, I get that. There, there are certain hymns that were go-tos for me back in the day, too, that yeah. I just, you know, and you I can... don't think that I have that level of aversion. Yeah. But there are certain songs, hymns, worship choruses, what have you, that my brain will just go into how dare you mode with me. It's like, how dare you spend so much time on this shit? How yeah. dare you put yourself through what you went through? And some of those songs even have other memories tied to them yeah. that increase the how dare you factor. It's crazy, but it's, yeah, true. it's true. Just being, just hearing some of this. I'm, I can hear some of these songs in like movies or TV shows that revolve around shyster preachers or, or just yeah. churches in general. And you hear some of this music and you haven't heard it in years. Oh my goodness, can it have a triggering effect? Yeah, definitely. Oh, totally. But that's, you know, that's just a, a little one one example. I mean, yeah. if we could sit here all night oh, and yeah. keep going over example after example after example, but I want to move along and talk a little bit about the causes of RTS in case this isn't completely and totally obvious already. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the causes of RTS. This is from the same source that uh, that I mentioned earlier, and we got actually got a couple of them. This one is from journeyfree.org, and it says, Authoritarianism coupled with toxic theology, which is received and reinforced at church, school, and home, results in suppression of normal child development. Two episodes on this one. Cognitive, social, emotional, moral stages are arrested. I like the way they put that. Yeah. It's very, very true. Damage to normal thinking and feeling abilities. Yeah. We talked about why so many Christians lack empathy. Right. Information is limited and controlled. Dysfunctional beliefs are taught. Independent thinking is condemned. And having feelings yeah. is condemned. I'm still, like, trying to feel my feelings instead of eating my feelings. Mm -hmm. And it's still really difficult to break that certain connection. Yeah. Like I said, these things can take years. I don't want to scare anybody out of leaving. No. But, you know, it can take years. And damage is being done right now. If you were in all of this stuff that we're talking about, if it's scaring you away from the concept of getting unbound, just understand this is where it's all happening. It's happening to you right now. Yeah. When you get out and you see it for what it is, it can be traumatic. But nowhere near as traumatic, I don't think, as being in this your entire life, never questioning it, and dying without ever actually having a life. That, to me, is way, way worse. Yeah. External 
locus of control. I've talked about this many times before, too, where you if you let externals control how you do things and, you know, some externals are necessary. Laws are necessary and laws are made to control our actions so that we don't go out there and kill each other. Hmm. But when it comes to personal morals and the things that define you as a human being, these things cannot come from external sources. They have to come from within you and what you understand about you. But when you externalize these things, knowledge is revealed and not discovered. Oh, man, I, I read that the first time. It gave me chills Yeah. because I don't want my knowledge revealed to me. No. I want something tangible that I can look at and say, well, this proves what you're telling me is true. But in the case of evangelicalism, this is very, very accurate where knowledge is revealed, not discovered. We are not um, we're not encouraged to discover things. We're encouraged to trust and obey right. for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Mm-hmm. Then there's the physical and sexual abuse aspect of this. If you're coming out of it and you were, let's say, you're one of the ones that was abused by a Catholic priest. And let's not even vilify the Catholic Church because this happens in evangelical circles all the time, too. Yeah. So regardless of what it was, if you experience this then obviously it's going to be part of post-traumatic stress and having it tied to church makes it part of religious trauma syndrome also from the time that you can understand you're brought up to believe in things like patriarchal power Um, you are instilled with unhealthy sexual views and then you've got the whole aspect of corporal punishment that far too many evangelicals still think is a good idea definitely Individual suffering from RTS may be struggling with, and this goes back to one of the other articles that are in the show notes, black and white thinking. You know, I've been accused of this recently, like within the last few years. My current boss and I have butted heads on various issues more than once. And one of the things that I remember her saying to me way back, like probably I was probably with her for two years at that point. And she said to me, you see things in very black and white terms. And whether or not you're right, it's not always reasonable or possible to follow that kind of thinking. And she's right. I mean, when it comes to things that are open to interpretation in terms of morals and ethics, then it can be dangerous to think that way because you never see other points of view. And that's the point there is that you need to be able to see other points of view and once in a while make some concessions which is very difficult for someone coming out of this irrational beliefs well do i really need to go into that one come on we're right i gave a prime example of it earlier difficulty trusting yourself trust in the lord with all your heart lean not on your own understanding this is what we're taught yeah low self-esteem I have to decrease so he can increase. You see where it all just starts coming together? Feeling indebted to a group of people. And of course, the church is what represents Christ. And the indebtedness there, you see the psychology that they use on you when they ask you for 10% of your income? Mm. Well, Jesus died for you. Is that worth 10% of your income? That's what they come at you with. It's nefarious and it's wrong, but that is what they do. We just talked about skewed views of sex, and we've talked about that on this show a bunch of times. Discipline, corporal punishment especially. You can develop a personality disorder as part of your religious trauma, which is treatable also. And it could also have been there at the time and likely was there at the time that you were in this. But there's something about evangelical faith that has a real talent for amplifying those symptoms of mental illness. Then there are the issues with relationships, people not wanting to be around you anymore, parents disowning their children over differences in spiritual beliefs and all of that. And then there's the whole self-expression aspect of it. You're not supposed to be an individual. You're supposed to die to yourself and let Christ live through you. So when you grow up or you enter into a faith-based system that encourages all of these things, it is a recipe 
for trauma when you figure out just how off your thinking is and how far off of any path of logic or reason you allowed yourself to be led it can be very very difficult to come to grips with that and a huge part of religious trauma syndrome and a subcategory of it is spiritual abuse in relationships now we've done some content already on toxic relationships but I think this article takes it just a step further than what I've uh, delved into before. You may find your, and this is direct. This is a direct and kind of lengthy quote, but I think that it's worth reading. You may find yourself in a relationship where spiritual abuse is occurring. If you wonder whether or not spiritual abuse is happening in your relationship, ask yourself if you are feeling shame regularly. And here are some questions to consider if you're worried if there's spiritual abuse in your relationships. Have you ever felt silenced by your partner? And I'm going to preface this. I don't think that any of this has ever applied to our relationship. No. Like at all. No. But have you ever felt silenced by your partner when trying to challenge or disagree about a religious idea? Do they call your thoughts silly, stupid, or wrong? Do you feel foolish for having a different idea? Do you feel shamed by your partner when you disagree about certain religious or spiritual ideas? Is it safe for you to challenge their ideas about religion? Does your partner force you to attend religious gatherings against your will? Well, I know a lot of parents that do. Yeah. Have you ever been shamed or punished by your partner for not obeying certain rules outlined by the religion? Punishment can be physical or emotional. Do you notice your partner using scripture, religious texts, or certain beliefs or rules to justify their harmful or abusive behavior? Does your partner isolate you from others outside of the faith tradition against your will? Fortunately, I don't think that I have ever experienced any of those things. No. And, you know, I'm grateful that I didn't. But I know I also know that there are lots and lots of people out there who have. Yeah. So if that's you, then, you know, you can just chalk that up to this is something that I should probably be dealing with and dealing with in a way that's going to get me from point A to point B in my thought process about this. And what that usually means is some good counseling and therapy, which we've also brought up many, many times before. Then there's the aspect of abuses within churches. And there are a lot of churches out there mm. that like to lord a lot of control over people. Do the leaders of the church hold all the authority? Absolute power. Remember yeah. that guy? Oh, yeah. Do they avoid distributing power to other members of the congregation? And again, I didn't see a lot of this. I was lucky because I know yeah. that I have aspects of this. I know that I have at least some semblance of religious trauma, but yeah. I also know that I never saw anything quite as extreme as this. Right. It's scary to think that it's out there though. Mm -hmm. And it is. Yeah. Does your religious community discourage free thinking, critical thinking, or opinions about their messages? That's evangelicalism in general right there. Right. If your church isn't discouraging those things, they're not doing their job. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Does your community imply that you are less valuable or worthy of love because of things you cannot change, like your gender, identity, sexuality, ethnicity, age, or anything else? Do they put down other religions and belief systems in order to uphold their own? Again, if your evangelical church isn't doing this, they're not doing their job. Right. Do you find yourself feeling more guilt and shame instead of love and belonging? Well, how can you not mm. in, in a setting that teaches you that everything good that you think about yourself is bad, that everything normal about yourself is somehow bad. And just to put a little bit more of a period on this whole thing, religious trauma syndrome mimics the symptoms of many other disorders. Post-traumatic stress disorder being at the top of the list, many clinicians believe that uh, RTS is a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. Clinical depression, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, and some of these things can be developed. Like I said, some of them may have existed when you were in it, but some of them can develop as a result of it. Obsessive compulsive disorder, borderline personality disorder, eating disorders, social disorders, marital and sexual dysfunctions. We've talked about our wedding night and yeah. honeymoon. Suicide, 
drug and alcohol abuse, extreme antisocial behavior, including homicide. That's very extreme. That is but very it extreme. does it does happen. Yeah. It does happen. In general, people who have not survived an authoritarian fundamentalist indoctrination do not realize what a complete mind rape it really is. That's another quick little quote from the same article. And that right there, I think, is an awesome description. A complete mind rape. The things they ram into your mind do damage, pure and simple. And rape is just one colorful descriptor that fits here. How about gaslighting? Just as a teenager, there was an onslaught of attacks on my mind and an out-and-out hijacking of my thought life. Everything that was fun but not Christian was sinful. Yeah. Movies, secular books, secular music, um, even just having normal feelings for someone of the opposite sex dating was taboo in a lot of evangelical circles. Then there was the uh, constant scrutiny about my behavior and how I spent my time. I always felt like I was under a microscope. I always felt like I was being watched and it felt awful. It really did. I felt like I had things to live up to that I didn't deserve to be made to live up to. Yeah. I was judged and shamed if I wasn't in church every damn time those doors opened. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday, family night, Friday youth group. I was so afraid to say no to anything church related. I risked my job a couple times to make sure that I got to youth group or to a youth group event. Then there was the pressure to live up to a higher standard than anyone else in the youth group. I was vocal to my youth pastor about my ministry calling early on as soon as i knew or had an inkling yeah i talked to him about it and of course he was thrilled but from that point forward i was expected to behave like a little pastor all the time if there was sarcasm negativity innuendo and which i have always been a master of (laughs) if any of that came out of my mouth i got everything from sideways glances to talking to's over it i was always looked up to and felt like i had a reputation to live up to And, you know, I was about to say that I don't know why, but come on, of course I know why. It's because of all the things that I just said. People saw that. They saw someone in me who was, quote unquote, more spiritual than they were. And the worst part of it was that I knew better. I knew me and I knew that I wasn't more spiritual than they were, but I knew what the persona looked like to them and I didn't correct them. That was the thing. And I hid a lot of me from a lot of people. When I say a lot, I mean Mm. a lot. There were things that I wouldn't dare talk to my youth pastor about that were going on in my head. There were certain habits and certain thoughts that I wouldn't dare talk to him about or anyone because it left me vulnerable and I couldn't afford to be vulnerable. I had to maintain the persona. And then there was the time when I quit listening to secular music for two years and I'm going to just give a quick little picture of what this looked like. Now, consider that this happened in the middle to late part of the 1980s. I want to say this was 1986 to 88, somewhere in that neighborhood. And now think about all of the amazing music that came out of the pop world during those two years. (laughs) Yeah. And the fact that I was oblivious to most of it because I was listening to nothing but Christian rock tapes. That was it for like two years. And and I was very self-important about it too. And I started feeling like I was better than a lot of these people because they were still listening to all this heathen secular music. And I was a real Christian because I loved God enough to not let that stuff inside my head anymore. But, you know, of course, that was just me and my deluded way of thinking about things. And I've, I've said it before, I was a little bit of a self-righteous prick. And I knew it. But I also knew that that was the persona that was being built up around me. And there was really not much I could do about it. I had to kind of roll with it. But yeah, for a good two years, I didn't listen to any secular music. And whenever I heard little snippets of anything on the radio, it felt threatening. It felt threatening to be around it, especially if it was even remotely in the context of something having to do with church. Because... A lot of those kids snuck in a lot of secular music and listened to it on the vans and were off in corners and listening to their to their newer tapes. And 
I judged the living shit out of these people for it. And it kind of sucked because it made me look like that much more of a judgmental little prick. Mm -hmm. Okay. It made me look way worse. And, you know, there was no reason for it. There was no reason for me to disconnect from pop culture the way I did. Oddly enough, I never stopped going to the movies. That was something that I allowed myself and it didn't bother me that I was doing that. But the music, I think it just had a lot to do with the satanic panic and things that were put in my head at that time. I just decided that this was one thing that needed to go and I let it go for way, way longer than I should have. And I destroyed a lot of music that I shouldn't have and miss it. Some of it's been replaced, but a lot of it hasn't. And I still miss it. So as we're winding things down a little bit here, I'm going to I'm going to address the question, at least as it pieces together in my head, of what caused the trauma? What was it that led to me having what I believe to be at least a mild case of religious trauma syndrome? Because I don't want to say that I have PTSD per se, but I have these elements of it as they relate to this emerging disorder. Um, What caused the trauma? Well, what would you say is the worst thing about every last thing that I mentioned so far? It comes down to this one thing for me. Yeah. There is a single, inescapable, rage-inducing common thread here that I'll bet you can't put a finger on, especially if you're still in this or have only been out for a little while. And if I'm making you think about this for the first time, I apologize, but better now than later. The worst part of all of this is how I never had to go through it in the first place. It was never necessary for me to go through this in the first place. I asked to go to Word of Life, and I asked to go every subsequent time I went back. I asked to go to the Faith Assembly Youth Group. I made the conscious decision to go to that god-awful excuse for a college, the second worst college in America for return on investment, according to Forbes magazine. Yeah. Okay? I made the choice to do that. I made the choice to be part of every VN weekend that I was on. I made the choice to go and serve all of those meals on trustees weekends. I made the choice to be in that community and keep going back and keep going back and keep going back for 20 plus years. Yeah. And it never had to happen. Right. All it would have taken was for me to not go to that camp and find something better and more productive to do with my time because there were secular camps out there too. Yeah. But I had to go to this one and all of these things happened and none of it ever had to be part of my life. And I mean, I was a good Catholic kid when I went up to Word of Life the first time, but I just get the impression that after a while, my faith would have gone the same direction that a lot of people's faith goes when they're part of that organization, they become Easter and Christmas Catholics. And it doesn't really mean that much to them beyond that. It's more of a cultural thing. A lot of Jews will say the same thing, that it's not really a a religion for them as much as it is a cultural expression. That's, this is their culture. This is who they are. This is their heritage. And this is how they honor their heritage. And I think that it's true with a lot of Catholics too. They have the token Easter and Christmas masses that they go to, but it doesn't mean much to them beyond that. I could have seen that being me and yeah. being happier. I may have still had a little bit of a tie to theism, but I'm pretty sure it would have gone away yeah. after a while. So that to me is the toughest part, is the fact that all of these things are things that I went through because I, not anyone else, not my mother, not my pastor, not anyone who was a quote unquote spiritual authority, but I put myself through and that's the most difficult part of it i have that issue as well because i made the choice you know when i was 14 to do stuff with that church that was like right across the street from me practically and i just kept going back and i regret not being a better person and leaving the episcopal church gradually instead of all at once i just abruptly stopped going yeah And it really kind of sucked that Mm -hmm. I did that. And it doesn't always work like we talked about last week. Yeah. And even when it does work, it can make those scars just a little bit worse. Yeah. And that's just, that's the uncomfortable 
truth about all this is that it's not going to be easy getting out. No. These, there are going to be thoughts and ideas that linger in your head. There are going to be difficulties. Not everybody's going to go through this. But in certain circumstances, there will be elements of it that mimic post-traumatic stress or actually manifest as a form of post-traumatic yeah. stress. So how do I deal with this? How does the spider deal with this in his own life? Well, for starters, it comes down to every single day, there are thoughts that go through my head about this. It's never not there, especially since we started doing this show, because now I've forced it all back to the forefront. Yeah. So it's never not there. That's a lovely double negative, but you know what I mean. Um, how do I deal with it? Well, simple. Every day I make the conscious decision to do certain things. First and foremost, to forgive myself for making all those bad decisions that I was way too smart to make in the first place. I purpose to forgive the people who got me in and kept me in. And this is a daily thing. Mm. It's not just a one-time decision. I try to remember that it's the system that was responsible, not the people. I do my best daily to accept the time lost and continue the process of letting go. I recognize the opportunity that I have every day to live my life under my terms and defining my own morality, not on things that society condemns, like murder or rape, but in things like my lifestyle choices and how they affect the person that I'm married to, who has stuck by me for three decades plus yeah. at this point. Yeah. I think about these things and understand that I'm better at defining my morals than any religion would ever be. Yeah. Because I know me and I know what society thinks about certain things. And I agree with the things that society says are morally wrong. But, you know, that's society. That's secular society. That ends for me when you start mixing religion into it. Yeah. It's amazing what happens when you detach your morality from religion and the way that you start looking at things and how insignificant some of these things that they place so much stock in actually are. Yeah. When you start thinking about these things in terms of yourself and what's going to make you happy, what's going to make it easier for people to live with you and how are you going to live your life so that when you lay your head down on that pillow at night and contemplate what went on during your day and what's been going on in your life lately that you can say i'm a good person and i do my best to make good choices i don't always succeed but i do my best and that's all that anyone can really hope for it makes it a lot easier to be comfortable with the notion of of deciding your own morals and your own ethics. Next, I remind myself that in most matters of morality, I have no one to answer to but myself and how much easier it has become to make good and right decisions since I ditched the notion of sin. Hmm. Finally, I work on me constantly, trying to be honest, transparent, and moral in all of my decisions. Every day and every way I'm getting better and better. And I keep telling myself this. It's true. It's a yeah. good mantra. I try to be slow to anger. It doesn't always work. <laughs> but it works a lot better now than it did before I got into therapy. Oh, yes. I've tried daily to become more at peace with my past. I try daily to become more optimistic about my future. Because right now, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? Yeah. Good things are happening here that I might get into in the next couple of weeks. It might be necessary to get into in the next couple of weeks because I might have to take a couple of weeks off from this and let some of these changes that are happening happen. Yeah. That's a little bit of a little bit of a, a tease for you. Maybe next week I'll go into that just a little bit more. But good things are happening in this house right now. Very good things. That, you know, six months ago I, I didn't even see. Yeah. So it's really, really neat. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, the number one thing that I'm doing right now to work on me is staying in therapy yeah it's necessary when you have any kind of post-traumatic stress or any kind of mental anything going on that's bigger than you can handle on your own then you need to have help so the biggest thing that i am doing and can do for me through all of this is staying in therapy and working this stuff out week to week 
and getting to know me better through that process. We've done so much content on why therapy is a good idea. I will again refer you back to past episodes about that. But I want to wrap this up because we're going wicked long. <laughs> and it's okay. It's perfectly okay. But I think it's time to put a cap on all of this and say good night for one more week. Yes, leaving religion can be traumatic. Seeing your situation from a getting unbound perspective can shine light on things you'll always wish you had a little bit less clarity about. Let's just put it out there. But it's important to understand what caused the trauma if you want to heal from it. Will you always feel better if you just stick with your routine, keep going to church, keep pretending to believe because doing that comes with friends and entertainment and good vibes? Here's the question. Do you want to feel better? Or be better. Because I can't see spending my entire life clinging to things that aren't real just to attend a picnic or a prayer breakfast once in a while. There are alternatives, and you'll find them. But if leaving my religion won't make me feel better, then why leave? Like I've said a few times now, today and last week, the trauma happens while you're still in. Seeing it for what it is and severing its influence on you is crucial to learning how to think for yourself. Ask yourself, do I like always feeling like I'm being watched or scrutinized? Do I like feeling pressured into going to church or spending all my free time at church functions? If what I believe is true, why do people have to be threatened with eternal torture to embrace it? If I figure out that I don't believe in this, how healthy is it to continue living a lie? Why stay in at that point? Should my entire identity and sense of self revolve around my faith? And what has God done for me, really? This is the biggest one. This is the most important one. What has God done for me, really? Can I even come up with one good thing that's happened in my life that can't be attributed to the kindness, empathy, knowledge, or skill of other people? Because that's where your help comes from. It doesn't come from anything otherworldly. That's where your help comes from. People who are kind, people who are empathetic, people who are knowledgeable like doctors and skilled in areas that you're not where you need help, especially with your physical being, but your emotional being as well. If you've listened this far, clearly you're looking for a reason to get out. Will you have post-traumatic stress over your experiences in evangelical faith? I have no idea. Some walk away and live perfectly well-adjusted lives and look back on that part of their life and laugh. Others feel the kinds of emotions I mentioned earlier. I still say that getting out and dealing with reality is still a better plan than staying in and feeding thoughts you know to be delusional and unlikely to be true. Stay where you are and you'll never really know yourself beyond the things that they want you to see. And so many of those things aren't even true, especially when it comes to the guilt that they heap on you. Take the first small step out of the confines of faith and see how much bigger the world is than that little house you've been confined to inside your brain. Once the initial fear subsides, and it will, I think you'll agree, it's far better to throw off the shackles of faith and start getting unbound. hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.